Sunday. Did you <laughs> last Sunday? Uh, oh, no, you last Sunday? Oh, last Sunday. Oh, oh, you last Sunday. Oh, oh, yeah. Tomorrow or Tuesday. Oh, I missed you. I was here. I was here. I was here. I don't have much wrong I can do. Too far. Hey, you're a young man. You just about to step away from the and I'm, you're real over there. Yeah. I'm looking at you. I've got a lady in my neighbor. She's going to see the sun. Deep run. Deep run baptism is three minutes from my house. Her sister. Joyce. Yeah. Joyce. 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 I would raise you all right here with you. I understand that. Then go downtown. Down by the Baptist. Yeah. And, uh, and we can't be here. Yeah. 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 I've been coming here for a long time. Nineteen fifty-six. It was a highway thing in the parking lot. It's two thirds of your life. It wasn't me. It was a hot day.
Lord's Day, I want to welcome you to this Sunday. I want to welcome you this week of life. And there's a lot of things going on. I want you to know, and, the, and I know it's a strange week and a strange time to be talking about it, but most of you will remember last summer, a good friend of mine, a friend of mine I haven't seen in years, I went to college with uh, his uh, two children, uh, who are 12 and 15, 16 I think now, um, 15. Um, I'm getting old, so I'm forgetting all these things. But I I'm saying this for a reason. Um, we uh, last year had uh, had them in our Belmore house, which is directly behind the church. They stayed months there. Uh, some of us had fellowship with them. Uh, he taught a class here. Most of you know that he was a missionary over where the conflict is right there. Uh, there. The Russians invaded his home in Odessa. And um, I, I knew I was going to mess up. But I want to, I want to tell you, when I said this, is, um, I don't want to, I'm trying to be very careful not to say his name. Most of us know his name and that. Um, but I know they made it safely out of the country. And they're trying to make it back home. Here's what's going to happen, and I want to ask you why I'm updating it to you. One is, there, they, if and when they get here, they're probably going to spend some time with family in North Carolina, but they will need a place to stay. I've already said and talked with my friend and said, you're more than welcome to stay at Belmore. We did that when people had to evacuate from Haiti a couple years ago. Well, what does that mean for us? One, it means that we will have to have groceries and other things to help them out. One of the needs is financial. Uh, if you want to give today and write a check and put um, Ukraine, we'll make sure it gets to this family. Okay. The other thing is they have family here. And so staying at Balmoral, um, they'll need help. Um, they'll, they left with nothing. Can you imagine leaving with nothing but the clothes on your back and they've left everything behind? Their friends, school, furniture, clothes. Uh, my friend's the same age as me and I just cannot imagine. Um, I also wanted to let you know, if some of you don't know, is I have their book here. And some of us went through this book study. I have still a couple of copies left and you're thinking, hey, I want to know more about this brave man and his family. We'd be glad to offer those to you. Um, the other thing is uh, they'll need a vehicle. Uh, I, I, uh, they'll need somewhere, because last time they rented, it cost from three to $6,000 just to rent a vehicle. And uh, they don't need that expense. So some of you might have an extra vehicle around, say, hey, I could get, get them a vehicle or lend them for a couple weeks until they find one to buy. That'd be great. Um, uh, and then we don't know if they're going to go back or not. There's a lot of what ifs right now, so be praying for this family. If you want to know the name, uh, I'll tell you afterwards. Uh, I do know um, any information I'm releasing and telling you this morning, I want everything else to come from the family and from him. And so if you have questions, please ask um, Gail here. Please ask several other members of the family. I'm trying to do that as much as possible. We are a church family. Guess what? This isn't even a missionary we support. Why do we do this? Because it's the right thing to do. So if you know other people saying, hey, I see these things on the news and that, what can I do to help? Say, hey, I know a person that's being affected by this. Here, you can help this way. Um, and so I, I know there's a Gobi fund. I know they're asking for other stuff as well. I don't know all the particulars. I just told you everything I know. Uh, but I know that we're offering them a home, a place to stay, free of charge. We'll pay their electric and everything, uh, internet, everything. Uh, we'll try to get them groceries. And uh, I'm not saying that um, in spite of bragging, I'm saying it because that's a need and we need to step up. So if you say, hey, I can step up, I can help. Uh, it's going to be a few days to a couple weeks so they'll the, um, maybe eventually be here because I, I, I did talk to this person and said we probably will take you up on that offer, but that gives us a little bit of time. But they don't have a lot of time. They need your prayers. And the other thing with that, we need to pray not only for the Ukraine, but also for
for Russia. You're thinking, what? Yeah, the Bible talks about praying for our enemies, being praying for those that persecute you, praying for our world and praying for peace. And so we're going to be doing that this morning before we lead off. I know there's a bunch of other announcements and other things in our newsletter. You can read that. And, and, and I'm not going to go through those this morning. I want you to be here this morning to realize how great of a God we serve. And how great of a God that we have worshipped. And how great of a God that saved our friends from the midst of turmoil and rescued them and kept them safe. And he's not done with them yet, and he's not done with you yet. So may you be encouraged this morning to worship our God and King. Let's pray. Let's pray this morning. Father God, I thank you so much. Lord, I, I want to pray for the whole situation that's happening in the Ukraine and uh, our brothers and sisters that are still there. Pray for those in Russia. Pray for our troops and everyone else that seems to be on edge. But Lord, we know that you are in control. You are a great and amazing and powerful and sovereign God that we trust in. Lord, we thank you for your, for your son. We thank you for the spirit that is within us. May we shine this morning as we get ready to worship you in spirit and in truth. We thank you for Jesus. And we thank you, Lord, for blessing us this morning. We ask and pray this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Won't you stand with me as we sing, as uh, Mr. Campbell comes and leads us in worship. Won't you stand with me as we get ready to worship. Stand, please.
this morning, and uh, our second song, our second hymn, rather, um, will be Rock of Ages. That's number 137 in your hymnal, and we'll sing verses 1 through 3 of that as well. Rock of Ages. Let me hide myself. Let me hide myself. Leviticus 22, 21, 
and 22, it says this. It says, when anyone brings from the herd or flock or fellowship offering to the Lord to fulfill a special vow or as a free will offering, it must, not be, it must be without effect or blameless to be accepted. Do not offer to the Lord the blind, the injured, or the maimed, or anything with warts or festering or running swords. Sores. Do not place any of these on the altar as an offering made to the Lord by fire. So often, we think of this time as pausing and reflecting on ourselves. But we talking about when Scripture talks about <clears throat> giving our best to Him. When I was little, as a child, we talk about dressing up in your Sunday best. And um, we see that God talks about giving back to Him His best. And the interesting thing is God gave His best for us. Himself. And so every Lord's Day we pause for a few minutes and remember the body that was sacrificed, the blood that was shed, the greatest love ever. A simple verse that we remember as kids is for God to love the world. That He gave His one and only Son. And so this morning we pause for that fact that God gave us Jesus. Let's go to Him in prayer. God, we thank You for giving Your best for us. Not that we deserve it, and so we reflect this morning, examining ourselves, realizing that we're not worthy, but you are. And we thank you for the body and the blood that was shed. And we do this in remembrance of you until you come again. We ask and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. So the night that Jesus betrayed, First Corinthians, we're told that he took bread, he broke it, he blessed it, he gave it to his disciples, saying, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's pray together. Father, we thank Verse 9 says, Honor the Lord with your wealth. And so we take up an offering to do that very fact. And the reason we take up an offering is just what I said in introducing our service is several years ago, we made the decision to buy Balmoral House. A part of that was, back at that time, was for expansion of the church. And uh, I don't know about you, but we found out that there's red tape, legal red tape, 
I don't know if you've ever dealt with the government, but there's bureaucracy. What? Yeah, we've even tried to combine both properties and other things, and, and they said you have to tear down Belmoro if we were to do that and all that. And so and we even talked about building offices back there. And they said, well, you would have to knock out the walls, expand the bathroom, do all, every door frame would have to be wider to make it ADA compliant and get a wheelchair over there. And then you have to put up a ramp. And by the time we did all of that remodeling, even the resale value would not make it worth it. So we decided to keep it just as a guest house, a missionary house. And guess what? I think God has blessed us for that. We've had people that have had to evacuate from Haiti. We've had people from Indonesia. We've had people from uh, uh, Asia. We've had people that have had to stay there during the COVID times. And now, uh, I'm telling you, we're going to have a family that had to evacuate their home. And I think God has blessed this church because we've been doing things like that. Why? Because we believe that we're in the Lord's business not the landlord's business. And I, I truly believe that. And I truly believe God has been blessing us because we've been doing the right thing. And so I always tell people, if you give to this church and you want to know where your money goes towards, we have <coughs> financial reports and we are glad to let you know. Um, God has been blessing our church. We're not wealthy by any means. But I want to tell you, this carpet, these pews, this whole building is yours. I want you ownership of it. Take care of it. Why? Because it's your building. You give back to it. It's a part ownership. The church is not a building. The church is the people. This is just where you gather. And so we are trying to be good stewards of how God has blessed us. And I don't take that for granted. And you shouldn't either. Um, I, I do know you support me. And so I don't want to take that for granted. I have family. I have kids. And so part of the offering goes towards us. For my salary, so I don't take that for granted either. And so we're going to go to the Lord in prayer, pray for our offering, and then we'll get into the message this morning. I'm really excited about today's message. I want to tell you that. So let's pray. God, we thank you for those that gave this morning, uh, the offering crates out there. And Lord, we pray for those that can't give at this time. Uh, Lord, we thank you for how you bless each of us. Lord, we pray for those that are struggling right now. And Lord, help us not to take for granted those that give. And help us to be good stewards of the money that you provide for us. We thank you, Lord, for all things. We ask and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I am so glad you're here. We're in our series in Galatians and uh, uh, the Apostle Paul. So if you want to turn in your Bibles, if you do not have a Bible, you're welcome to take one in front of you. If you need one badly, please take it. You did not steal it. We gave it to you. We do not want our Bibles to be collecting dust here. If you say, hey, Gerard, the print is so small. Um, I have bifocals, so I understand about small print. And so uh, if you need a large print Bible, please say, hey, I need a large print Bible. If you need a Spanish Bible or some other type of Bible, we'll, we'll try to find one for you. And uh, we want you to be in God's Word, not to be believing everything the preacher says. I want you to be listening to what I say today, but I want you to check it out with what God's Word says. In your uh, um, bulletin this morning, there was a song service. Uh, announcements, prayer requests, newsletter, all of that stuff. And so I know what's going to happen. Some of you will be opening your Bibles. Some of you will be taking notes. Some of you will be reading the newsletter. And that's okay. Some of you might be taking a nap. I, I know that happens. I want to take a nap. I really do. <laughs> but you know the best time to take a nap is? Sunday afternoon. So I am excited that you're here. And so let's get into the Word today and uh, um, go from there. So we're in Galatians chapter 2. And the Apostle Paul wrote this church to the Galatian churches about 53 to 57 AD. And he's trying to encourage them. But he's saying, wake up. Here's what i got to say. Don't desert. And last week I talked about don't desert for another gospel message. And so he... He's saying that, don't deserve for another gospel message. And today, he's talking about choosing your battles wisely. 
Have you ever gotten into those choosing your battles wisely? And so we're in Galatians chapter 2, and uh, the Apostle Paul talks about the, the Galatians, that they were deserting another gospel, and then he's saying, hey, no, I'm the Apostle Paul, I got accepted by the other apostles, and this is why you should listen to the message I have to you. And so we are right into it, and we have to choose our battles wisely and go from there. Um, so in Galatians chapter 2, verses 1 through 14 says this, this is what it says. Follow along. And I'm reading from the NIV. Um, the reason I read from the NIV is because that's what most people have. It's a new international version. Um, they say that the NIV isn't written about the 7th or 8th grade reading level. King James is about the first uh, year of college reading level. And nobody really speaks thou's and these anymore. How thou doing? How deeth thou good? Nobody does that anymore, do they? No. I grew up on the King James. I love the King James Version Bible. But I want to understand God's Word, so I'm going to be reading the NIV this morning, okay? And if you got offended about me poking fun of the King James Version, you come into my office, and I'll show you how many versions of the King James Version Bible I have. I have more than the NIV, so yeah. So I'm poking fun of myself. So, so where was I? I almost feel like I have ADHD, and it's like if you say squirrel, I'm like, yeah, yeah. So anyways, Galatians chapter 2, and, and uh, um, uh, so we're reading verses 1 through 14. It says, 14 years later, I went up to Jerusalem, this time with Barnabas. I took Titus along also. I went to respond to a revelation and set before them the gospel that I preached among the Gentiles. But I did this privately to those who seemed to be leaders for fear that I was running or had run my race in vain. Yet not even Titus, who was with me, was compelled to be circumcised, even though he was Greek. This matter arose because some of the brothers had infiltrated our ranks to spy on the freedom we have in Christ, Jesus, and to make us slaves. We did not give in to them for a moment, for the truth of the gospel might remain with you. As for those who seem to be important, whether they are makes no difference to me. God does not judge by external appearances. Those men added nothing to my message. On the contrary, they saw that I had been trusted with the task of preaching the gospel to Gentiles, just as Peter had been to the Jews. For God, who had been working the ministry of Peter as an apostle to the Jews, was also working my ministry as an apostle to the Gentiles. James, Peter, and John thus reputed to be pillars, gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship when they recognized the grace given to me. They agreed that we all should go to the Gentiles and they to the Jews. All they asked is that we should continue to remember the poor, the very thing I was eager to do. When Peter came to Antioch, I opposed him face to his face because he was clearly in the wrong. Before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles, who was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. The other Jews joined him in his hypocrisy, so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. When I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter in front of them all, You are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile, not a Jew. How is it then that you force Jews to follow, force Gentiles to follow, Jewish customs. So there's a lot of things in this passage. One of the um, things uh, that I have in opening is that in enduring freedom, earning freedom is the account of Michael Santos, who at age 19 was sentenced to 45 years in prison for heading up an illegal drug organization. Inside prison, he devised himself to, a plan to educate himself, support group, and contribute the needs of society to enter the world again. He had earned two degrees, built a website, wrote several articles, and after serving 25 years of his 45-year sentence, was released and today continues to write and speak about the power of human determination and will. His story is one of self-salvation, willpower, and that. But it's interesting 
Now we find that he did this on his own and earned this on his own, but grace cannot be earned on our own. We cannot earn God's salvation. God has already earned it for us. And so we see in today's passage a couple of things. When Christians need to die, we need not to die on every hill. This is why you hear about choosing your battles wisely. Is it to fight? Now, you know, I know in past ministries, we fought over silly things. Color of carpet. Painting the walls. What, what type of chairs we should have. I even had one meeting in my first ministry where the two elders were getting ready to have a boxing match and get at it. Can you believe that? And, and, and it's interesting. What battles are you choosing to die for? What hill is you are you willing to go to battle for? As someone told me once, choose your battles wisely. For me, and maybe for you, I want to challenge you to die for the gospel message. Be willing to go through that hill. Silly things like color of carpet and paint and just little things like that are not worth dying for. And so we have to choose our battles wisely. Paul went to Jerusalem and uh, he had to seek confirmation of his convictions. And that's the first uh, um, blank there they have. You have to seek confirmation of your convictions. Convictions. Verses 1 through 3 talks about that. The confirmation of his own convictions. What convictions do you have? Sometimes we disagree and we get upset and angry. But it's okay. We've got to learn to do this thing called to be civil. To be civil to one another. To agree to disagree. Not everything, every opinion that every person has is going to be the same as yours. And it is okay to agree to disagree. And we have to have this self-determination of how to continue in that. Paul told Timothy to be not ashamed for whom I have believed. In Romans, uh, uh, Paul wrote that I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Do you know that right now there are 52 countries and 14 areas where the name of Jesus is not allowed. And they're struggling behind all of that. And are you saying today that I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, even though people may disagree with me? Where I grew up right now, you cannot really, and it's a problem right now, you cannot preach against uh, homosexuality. Earlier this year, uh, my uh, uh, home preacher and a couple others talked about biblical marriage. And a lot of them got in trouble. But they talked about that. And I always tell people, we as a church, we're very conservative. We're pro-life. We're pro-biblical marriage. And we're pro-Jesus. People need to know the things that we're pro. And not just what the things we're against. You know, uh, people say, well, why do you talk about homosexuality and all this other thing? Trust me, I, I talk about gluttony and lying and gossiping and all of that. And sometimes when I'm pointing those things out, I'm pointing to myself as well. And maybe I'm stepping on your toes as well. And so I recognize that those sinful things that we have, but we need to have this self-determination. And then the, the second part, and this is where the Apostle Paul talks about this, it's to be careful with your critics. In verse 4 he says, False brothers were secretly brought in to bring us into slavery. He faced opposition. The Apostle Paul's facing opposition in every fact. And so when you have critics in your life, how are you going to face them? And you will have critics. If you don't have them now, you will, or you're going to pretty soon, that are going to be careful. You have to be careful with those critics. I like how Charles Spurgeon, he had used his students to keep a blind eye and a deaf ear. He said, be deaf and blind to the long-suffering differences which may survive in the church. And it sounds like sound advice. All of us are going to face critics. Paul refused to entangle in dialogue with him. He charged Timothy to avoid critics as well. 
And some situation calls for us to engage our critics, and others call for us to be loving with our critics. Romans 12 talks about, it's like when we're kind to those that hurt us, it's like heaping hot coals on their head. Someone criticizes you, guess what? Make them cookies. <laughs> be nice to them. Now, next week, I don't want to see a bunch of cookies on my desk, by the way. <laughs> but you get the idea. Be nice to those that criticize you. There might be an ounce of truth in what they're saying, even if you don't like to hear the criticism. And I like it that we don't have to face all of our critics and respond to them all. So ask yourself, do you find yourself responding to every critic? Why do you feel the need to be right and engage and manage the opinions people have of you? If you're online, do you have to respond to every criticism? Sometimes the best thing is to turn it off, to get away from it. I am so glad that I'm not a young person today. <clears throat> because probably the, some of the stupid things I did as young would end up on YouTube and be there forever. And some of you are thinking, yeah, I'm so glad that isn't there either um, for yourself, not just me. But you realize that the criticisms you have. But the kids used to be that you were made fun of at school. And it didn't matter. You'd go home and you're like, who would care less? That's just cool. But when kids go home today, it doesn't leave. It's there in front of them on the screen. Attack, 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 bully, bully, bully. And uh, we live in a different world that facing critics. And we have to teach people how do we are careful with our critics? How do we ignore them? How do we move on? And then we have to rest. In the role God has assigned in us. Uh, James, Peter, and John gave Paul and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship. Sometimes that's what we need to do, is give the right hand of fellowship. When you give someone the right hand of fellowship, when you shake someone's hand, you give them a hug or that, you, you need to teach people this too, by the way. You look them in the eye and you shake their hand firmly. You don't give them a little wet handshake. You shake it firmly and say, I'm so glad you're here. The right hand of fellowship. It's a strength. It's a courage in that. Now we do kind of, because of COVID and everything, we, we don't hug or anything. We do fist pumps and all that. And that's okay. But you recognize the right hand of fellowship saying, hey, I accept you. I'm glad you're here. And uh, the body of Christ is a beautiful thing. We work together. And so Paul discusses the spiritual gifts for one another in Romans 12. And we have to learn to be arrest in our roles. What role does God have for you in His church? Are you using your giftedness to be part of the body? Your talents, your abilities. And saying, God, I am so glad I'm here and this is what I can do to enhance the church. I'm not just saying mind, but I'm saying the church as a whole. And that people see Jesus in you. And see Jesus in me. And see that there's something different about you. Because Jesus is working through you. And how do we celebrate those things? How do we celebrate people that are working behind the scenes? How do we celebrate those people that put together the bulletin? You, you guys do realize the, the, the pieces of paper that you have this morning in front of you? Those things don't magically appear. Someone has to type it out. Someone has to print it off. Someone has to fold it, put it all in there, and then put it out. And it doesn't magically. It's some, there's some volunteers that do that. That proofread it, go through it, and all that. There's a lot of stuff that goes into that. And that's just the bulletin. Think about the people running the live streaming. You think, well, why are we live streaming? We have several um, of our elderly saints that are at home and can't come here and are in their uh, 80s and 90s. And so we have probably uh, 13, 14 different homes, not people, homes, that watch every week. And so uh, I know that of several of those homes, there's two, three, or four people watching. And so when you see 30 on there, you add a lot more. You might have 50 or 60 people that gather with this church 
together every Sunday. I'm not sure if you have thought about it that way. But as a body, the different things, the live streaming, the computers, the, the music that we have. Sometimes we take that for granted. Especially when I'm leaning on a Sunday to talk a cappella. You're like, <clears throat> yeah. Wish Ben was here. Wish uh, the pianist was here. Yeah. yeah. So, But we, we know all those ministries and we need to celebrate them. Uh, uh, celebrate all the different things uh, uh, that God does. And then we need to refuse to give in when it comes to the gospel. Some people uh, uh, misinterpret a lot of these verses in verses 11 through 14. Let's read them again. 11 through 14. It says, When Peter came to Antioch, I opposed him face to face because he was clearly in the wrong. Because certain men came from James and he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate from the Gentiles because they were afraid of those involved with the circumcision group. The other Jews joined him in his hypocrisy, so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. When I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter in front of them all, You are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile, not a Jew. How is it then you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? We all know this. It's a click. We play favorites. Oh! And this is what Peter did. I'm hanging out with the Gentiles. Oh, there's my Jewish buddies. Who are those guys? Don't know. I'm hanging out with someone else popular. Uh -huh. and, and it almost feels like middle school or high school at this time. And Paul sees this to Peter. You, you know who Peter is, right? Peter the rock. Peter who's supposed to be leading the church. Peter, who denied Jesus three times, but preached the gospel message on the day of Pentecost. Peter is supposed to be a pillar, but he um, was not. So the Apostle Paul, who was kind of new, opposes him and sees this whole self-righteousness, this whole thing he's not supposed to do. And so Paul opposes him to his face, not only that, but in front of them, saying, what are you doing? And sometimes that's what we need to do is go up to people and say, hey, I see your hypocrisy. What are you doing? Smarten up. We almost like want to take a two by four off to people and say, smarten up, right? Not that we do. I mean, lovingly and caringly, a soft two by four. I'm not sure if there's such a thing as a soft two by four, but you, you get the idea that Paul did this. And we, 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 we as Christians, we fight over everything. Anything. Oh, I wish we had comfortable chairs, don't you? I wish we had added backs on the seats, don't you? And we, we fight over that, over chairs. We fight over carpet. We fight over free will. We fight over end times. Well, my end time do is this, this, and this. And, and, and we fight over all of these things. We fight over worship style music. Oh, you guys are old hymn style. That's not right. Oh, you, you're doing it rock band style. That's not right. Hey, why can't we just rejoice that people are being reached in all different styles of music? That people are being reached in all types of buildings? That the gospel is being preached? And I think that the arguments and all these disagreements is kind of silly. And then we divide, divide, divide. And no wonder the world looks at us and says, that is so silly and I don't want to be any part of that. That's why I love the whole Christian church, Church of Christ. And if you're new to being a part of a Christian church, Church of Christ, basically how it started was this. They saw all these different denominations. And they said, I just want to be Christian only. I just want to do what the Bible says. I don't want to have a denominational leader. I don't want to do all of this. Let's just do what the Bible says. Be Christian only. So there are people from Presbyterian and Baptist and, and all of these type of things. And they said, let's be Christian only. And you know what happened though? And even that got divided. Well, you worship with an instrument. Can you imagine fighting over an instrument? <laughs> and that's what happened. And so we have the Church of Christ non-instrumental. We have the Christian Church, Church of Christ, which we're part of. And then, then through the years, the theology changed, and then even some of the disciples of Christ. And it's just sad that we fight over all these things and say, well, what is, 
or who is, and we fight over all the different things. But the clear thing is, what hill are we willing to die for? Isaac Watts understood how precious the gospel was when he wrote these words. Love's so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, is the gospel message, the good news message that Jesus died for you and for me, something that changes our lives? Are you choosing your battles wisely? You know, uh, it reminds me of some of the arguments we have that are kind of silly. So, honey, where are we going to go out to dinner? You ever had that argument? Where are we going to go eat? Ever had that argument? But the gospel message, it's powerful. Jesus Christ died for you and for me. And it's something that we should never forget. Which battles are you choosing? Are you firm in your convictions? So we need to reiterate to people today, it's okay to agree to disagree, but we need to be secure in our values, our convictions, and our beliefs. Our belief that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And preach the gospel. I saw online on Facebook this week, people said, what are you going to be preaching on on Sunday now that our world has changed? My response was this. I'm going to preach the gospel in season and out of season. And it's to reprove, to correct, and to rebuke, and to train in righteousness sake. Why? Because that's what the Apostle Paul told Timothy to do. We need to preach the word. All of it. The good, the bad, the ugly. Because when you read God's word and you read the Bible, you're like, whoa, I didn't know that was it. Yeah, that's in there. Why? Because God deals with messy people. They're broken. And it shows the brokenness of people. Why? Because it shows the need for a Savior. I am not the Savior. My job is to point to the Savior. Your job is to point to the Savior. To tell the good news that Jesus died for you and for me. The Paul opposed Peter because he said, Hey, don't be so self-righteous. Embrace the righteousness that Christ died for you. Don't be two-faced. This is hypocrisy no more. And so we as a church need to rise up and say, I am embracing Jesus Christ and following Him the rest of my days. My question is, are you with me? And I hope you are. I have a friend right now that is struggling in his own life. Why? Because of the brokenness of his home, his home country. Yes, he, he's originally from here, but his home country and he's coming home. You know what, though? I know ultimately he knows where his citizenship is. In heaven. He trusts in him. I told you that when his family comes, we need to prepare a place and help him uh, with Belmont. But you know what? Even more than that, he knows who has prepared a place for him for eternity. My question this morning is, do you know that? Do you know Jesus Christ? That he died for you, he loved you so much, and he rose for you, and he's coming again. And if you believe that and are not a Christian and would like to be, we'll baptize you right today. We have the baptistry ready. We have water. And it actually is heated this time. <laughs> Some of you are laughing, but you remember a couple weeks ago when it was not heated, and we had two ladies come forward, and they it was a baptism they'll never forget. <laughs> and it was cold. But uh, uh, maybe that's you this morning saying, hey, yeah, I want to follow Jesus the rest of my life. Or maybe you're saying, Gerard, I, I just need prayer. I don't know how I'm going to face uh, of the world today, but I need some prayer. And I don't know what, what tomorrow's going to bring. But, and we don't know, need to know all the situations. You say, hey, I, I need some prayer in my life. Things aren't going the way it should. Or maybe you're looking for a home church. And I always tell people, we're, we're not a perfect church. If you're looking for the perfect church, we're not it. Go somewhere else, because we're not it. We're, we're broken and we're, 
we, we, we realize that we serve a perfect Savior. That's why we're here. But we're striving. We're on that journey together. And that's why I love this family. And we're on this journey together and trying to do what's right. So in a moment, we're going to sing a concluding song. And if you have a decision, won't you come? If you don't, pray for those that do. Pray for those that are watching. Pray for those that are missing in the pews this morning. And I believe that prayer is powerful. Pray through your singing. And as we do that this morning, what you stand as we sing, the burdens are lifted at Calvary. Verses 1 and 2. The burdens are lifted at Calvary. Stand with me.